and welcome to Ben Coomba Radio. This is episode, I believe, number 319. Um, if that's wrong, it is fine because I've got it wrong for the last five or six shows, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but I'm, I've been given the honour of presenting one of the Thursday shows, so I'm really happy about that. Today I've got a guest on that some of you guys may know of. Um, I'm speaking today with Emma Story Gordon, who is someone that, to be honest, like it's a real pleasure to have her on because I've followed your work for ages. And I think the content you put out on social media and everything's really good. So I think we should have a really good conversation. So hello, Emma, how are you doing? Hello, I'm brilliant. Um, I should probably say that I pretty much forced you to have me on, but yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Um, so then just for the audience who aren't really sure about who you are, do you want to tell us sort of what you're up to and, and everything that's going on with yourself at the minute? Because I see that your coaching's kind of taken off quite a lot in the last few months. Yeah, okay, so generally one, I hate speaking about myself, but I guess a lot of you wouldn't know who I am, so I should say. Um, I am now largely an online personal trainer. Um, previously, I was involved in a lot of, well, I went to university and then I got involved in the science side, so a lot of research in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and then later cancer research um, in relation to exercise. Um, kind of fell away from the academia world and decided that I'd much rather work for myself. And so, yeah, I really pushed my online coaching business. I do a lot of group coaching as well. Um, yeah, and have the opportunity to work with actually hundreds of people at the moment, which is amazing. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, but yeah, I think it's because I do, at least I like to think, um, that I think about things in sort of the more academic side of things. And I just, I'm interested in nutrition from that perspective. Um, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, just that's the interest I have. I'm not good at it. I'm just interested in it. Um, and I read your book, you're good. <laughs> and that, that's why I've always found your content really interesting. And I think, so to, to sort of put this into a bit of context, what happened was Emma posted a, like an infographic about a gene that's linked to both a sweet tooth and lower body fat, which I found really interesting um, because it's not something that you would think would be connected. But as we'll get into it later, genetics is a little bit more complicated than a lot than it may appear at first glance so I commented on that and just said it's really interesting because one of the observations that I think a lot of people have is that you'll get at least one person in every office who can seemingly eat whatever the hell they want and they don't put any body weight on um, and I just always find it really interesting to look at, at the individual differences between people in free living conditions because I talk a lot about environment. Um, I'm actually presenting at Body Power this year on food environment. And I think it's a topic that's very interesting for coaches because it's something that we can actually change and we can help our clients with. If we can help a client to create a, an environment at home that's more conducive to a dieting approach, then it means the dieting can be a little bit easier for them. But it's still interesting to note that there are individual variances because I think what I posted on that um, on that thread was that there seems to be a difference between people who aren't paying attention to nutrition in the same environment. So two people who don't really pay attention to what they eat, they're not bothered about health and fitness, but the environment will cause one of them to end up being overweight and, and the other one won't. And it's something that I found really interesting. So I thought to sort of kick this off, I thought we could maybe spitball a little bit about a few of the differences between individuals that, that you've read about and that you're aware of that can influence that. And obviously we will preface this with the caveat that we're not going to cover everything. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't think of this as, as the ultimate answer because there's a lot more that goes into it. So yeah, we'll be here that, all week speaking about that if we try to cover everything. Yeah. <laughs> and we still wouldn't scratch the surface. And there's, yeah. there's loads of stuff that we don't even know. So I just think this industry, it is known that like, if someone is obese, it is because they've had a chronic positive energy balance for a significant period of time. But that's just the proximal cause. And, and there's a lot of distal causes that can actually play into that. So where, where do you think we should start? What would be? Well, what? I guess the whole, it all comes back to 
the question we're talking about today, which is why do some people put on weight or become obese, given that we actually all have roughly the same environment? So within the same environment, one person will become obese and one person won't. And why is that? And there are, you know, there's numerous reasons, but what I kind of wanted to look at was the genetics of that and your sort of predisposition to that. Um, so there are, yeah, it is true that some people are predisposed to putting on weight, whereas others find it fairly easy to maintain a certain body weight or a healthy body weight. Um, and a lot of people like to, or a lot of, well, I don't know if they like to, but a lot of overweight people will say that it's their genetics that, you know, it's all, all almost used as an excuse. Mm. Um, and I think people misunderstand how genetics can impact. So it's not the fact that even though you, you're in an energy deficit, you're not, you're not losing weight because of your genetics, but your genetics may make it harder for you to lose weight by two main factors one of them being increasing your drive to eat, so your hunger levels, and the other one being reducing your activity levels. So something we see really often in dieting is a reduction in what we term NEAT, so non-exercise activity thermogenesis, basically a very fancy way of saying how much you move during the day that's not structured exercise. So some people, when they diet, experience a huge subconscious reduction in their activity levels which largely accounts for some of the deficit that they've made and sometimes accounts for the whole deficit. So they may think, oh, I'm only, you know, I've made a 500 calorie deficit in my diet. I should be losing body fat, but actually you're moving that much more that that deficit is now almost negated. And in some cases completely negated. And part of your predisposition to what we call activity compensate when reducing calories is genetic. Um, some people won't reduce their activity levels when they diet and others will reduce them hugely. And in fact, there's um, quite a few interesting studies on mice that show the variation in their response to the same diet. So let's say there's a group of mice, they've all been put on exactly the same calories. Well, no, actually, they've all been put in the same deficit. So they're all in, let's say, a 20% deficit. Some of them lose more weight than others. And it was found that this difference in weight loss was completely attributable to the difference in their activity compensation. So the difference in how much they moved. Um, and that's really interesting. And obviously, yes, it's a mouse model. Yes, there's limitations, but we can't physically do that in humans. And a million other factors come into play when you look at trying to study a human. Um, but in a very enclosed and controlled environment, we can see that that plays a huge role. And it's something that most people don't really think about. So, they, you know, you'll speak to someone who's convinced that they're only eating X amount um, and that they should be in a deficit. And by your calculations and by looking at them, you're probably like, yeah, you should be. But, I mean, has something changed? Is, is, your, is it your activity? And most people will say, no, I'm still very active. Or now it's less common because so many people have Fitbits or activity trackers. So you can actually account for some of that potential reduction in activity levels. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the reasons that I really do heavily promote the use of things like Fitbits with clients. Um, we do know that, again, there are limitations with them. A Fitbit won't be able to accurately predict calorie expenditure all that well. But the, the, I think that's kind of missing the point. The point is that you can quantify, to some extent, the amount of need that somebody has because you can say, well, before the diet, you were averaging 9,000 steps a day. We've cut your calories down by 20%, and now you're only hitting 5,000 calories a day. Do you think that we could maybe readdress that balance because then that's going to, that's going to help out. I think it, it, it is fascinating to look at the differences because there's, there's one study and I couldn't find it earlier, but I will put it in the show notes um, so that anyone listening can have a look. But there's a study done on sets of twins at a US university where, and, and <clears throat> so identical twins are interesting for this because they basically have the same DNA. Um, that's why they're identical. And what they did was they put them in essentially a metabolic ward. So they, they kept them in a wing of the university 
um, laboratory. And over the course of the summer, they overfed them with the same, like, the same principle. So it's the same surplus as opposed to the same deficit. And the differences in between pairs of twins, so pair of twins A and pair of twins B, the differences were huge. So some of them would gain a whole bunch of weight. Some of them wouldn't gain weight at all. Some of them lost weight. Um, but between those pairs, so pair of twins A, they gained or lost or maintained to the same degree. So we can see that genetics does have at least some role. I do want to go on later on to this because I think genetics is fascinating, but we shouldn't, as we said at the start, it's more complicated than that. And there's more than just genetic factors. So there are some lifestyle things that differ between people that aren't necessarily genetic. Um, but paper I pulled up a little bit earlier by Heine, uh, Toplak and Mitrakow, which is three horrible names to try and pronounce with my English accent. Um, they basically said that involvement of the genetic factors in the development of obesity is estimated to be 40 to 70 percent with at the time of writing, so this paper came out in 2008, um, almost 600 obesity candidate genes have been described. Um, and I think ignoring factors like that and just placing it all entirely on the individual, like it's a flaw with them, because they're struggling to lose weight and therefore they're struggling to lose weight, but this client isn't. And therefore this client is just a bit shit. I think it's kind of jumping the shark a little bit. It's oh, kind of Yeah, a hundred percent. And as much as we're saying like genetics plays a huge role. And I think that gets misconstrued into the fact that, oh, I can't lose weight because of my genetics. Even when I diet, I can't lose weight. No, that's not true. But the <laughs> fact is, it is harder for you to lose weight. That means you might need more support. That means, yeah, it's, you're going to maybe struggle more, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. And it doesn't mean that just because you have this predisposition, you have to be overweight. And yeah. just because these, you know, like the 70% heritable or, you know, there's, there is some really like amazing research that shows that BMI is actually more heritable than height. So you would definitely not, you know, like, or it's similar. I can't remember if it was um, the same or, in fact, more heritable than height, which is obviously genetic. You know, how tall you are, you can't, it is a sort of combination of your mum and your dad or your mum or your dad. Um, yeah. So it is, it is interesting and it does hugely affect, but often sort of misconstrued that, this means that just because of your genetics you should give up or use it as an excuse it, it just means you're probably going to have to work a little bit harder maybe you need a bit more support yeah absolutely and I think that that what you just said at the end there is a really important thing as well because whenever we talk about genetics in fitness the first question that a lot of people think of is oh well should I go and get my genetics tested should I do, do one of these gene testing things um so I thought it would be useful to ask your opinion on that for the listeners and and what your, what your views are in that direction? I would say no. If you're a bit of a geek and you kind of want to see like what your genetics are and this, that and the other, then yeah, cool, get it done. But most of what it's going to tell you is what you already know. So if, and, and even if it's not, why is that ever going to change anything that you do? So say I got mine back and it said, oh, actually, you'd be a really good endurance runner. You know, you've got these certain genes and these certain gene variants you're predisposed to being a good endurance runner. Well, the fact is I don't like endurance running. I've never been good at it. And like, I know myself that it's not something that I enjoy doing. Uh, on the flip side, if I got it back saying, you know, you've got this gene, it's going to predispose you to putting on a lot of weight, blah, blah, blah. Like, does that help someone who's overweight knowing that they've got that gene? I'm um, probably not. They, and to be honest, they probably kind of know if they've always struggled with weight, if they've always struggled, it is likely that there is some predisposition, whether that be genetic or their upbringing or their environment, or most likely a combination of hundreds of factors. Um, like, does that information help them? And is it actionable? In my opinion, no. No, it could almost be seen as being disempowering. I think like if you find, if you've got someone who believes that they're always going to struggle losing weight and then they get a piece of paper that confirms that with a genetic test. Um, I think that's basically telling someone that you, they might as well give up. Yeah. Whereas, and and if, it, uh, if it was like, 
if there was an example where, okay, you've got this gene, that means you're going to struggle to lose weight. Here's a solution for you. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. But there isn't a solution. No. It just means that maybe it's going to, you're going to struggle more and you already know that. So why pay to get it tested and get it in paper? Yeah. And I think that, I think, while that is the case, I do think it's still important for coaches to be aware of this kind of thing, just because it does allow you to be a little bit more sort of empathetic towards your clients. It, it, it does allow you to understand a little bit more that there, there are variances between people's disposition to being able to lose and maintain that loss of weight. And therefore, we shouldn't be... I think historically, I, I know there's a lot of good coaches now, and I think that the coaches with whom I speak in, and probably the same will be for yourself. Um, they are empathetic coaches anyway. They're, they're personal trainers. That they care about their clients and they are very understanding, but I don't think that that is yet um, the industry standard. I think there is still a lot of people who do not necessarily look down on overweight people, but that kind of thing. And being aware of these variances, I think can maybe go some way towards reducing that. I mean, what do you think on that? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. And I think probably a bigger part of this is education for trainers or coaches or people that are helping people lose weight. Um, because there's still often in our industry, and <clears throat> wrongly, completely, but the sort of misconception that because someone's overweight, they're fat and lazy. Mm -hmm. And like, that isn't the truth. And, you know, most of us have moved into this industry probably because we find it quite easy to maintain our weight or we enjoy exercise we enjoy eating healthy and we've never struggled hugely with our weight some of us have some of us haven't doesn't make you a better or worse coach um but having that empathy towards people that are overweight people that have struggled more than you have potentially that's hugely important and not having that understanding and just assuming that if you're overweight it's because you're, you're lazy it, shouldn't ever be the thought process anymore no i mean even even what you said there with people who enjoy exercise is there a genetic component to that i believe i've read something along the lines of the like the runner's high that everyone talks about i'm sure that i've read somewhere that that has a genetic component or is that not something you've you've looked into i've not looked into that specifically i know that your response to exercise in terms of hunger Mm -hmm. um, some people respond by a huge increase in hunger and others don't have that increase in hunger. Again, making it much harder for someone to diet. If you know, you're telling your client, okay, we're going to do some more exercise. We both know that exercise doesn't actually burn a lot of calories has huge benefits aside from that. But in terms of weight loss, it's not, it's not that big a factor. If that then means that they're going to eat more as well, because their hunger levels have gone up, you know, you could find that making a or getting a client to exercise if you're not being careful with their diet and their tracking means that they actually put on weight. Um, yeah. And their response to exercise is largely genetic. So yet some people will um, exercise and not feel an increase in hunger and some people will have this huge increase in hunger. Um, so that's interesting. I don't know about the runner's high. Pro mm -hmm. You're quite possibly right. Um, in terms of like enjoying exercise, I, you could argue that that's genetic just in the case that people that are sort of better at exercise tend to enjoy it more um, and they'll be more predisposed to keep doing it just because, you know, if you were good at school and you had fun at school doing exercise, you're more likely to carry that on into later life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I just, I just think this kind of conversation is fascinating. I mean, some, some other things that I did look at um, this morning before we came on here, um, because another area that I, well, what one, another one of the lessons that I teach on the academy is to do with stress. And I think two of the big take homes that I found from that while I was researching that topic in general is first of all, the childhood trauma in obese and overweight women with food addiction and clinical level of binge eating is highly correlated. So childhood trauma, be that um, something like a messy divorce with your parents or it could be abuse, or it could be anything along those lines that correlates really strongly with food addiction and binge eating. Um, so if, if we are working with people who come from these kinds of backgrounds, then that is going to be a significant problem. And, and another one is that psychological stress and stress instances across the lifetime. So not just 
sort of the what's the, the subjective experience of being stressed all the time, but also objective measurements of stressful situations. Both of those correlate really well with BMI. So if we're looking at, again, an overweight person, it, it sounds almost cliche to say it now, but you don't know what their background's like and you don't know about all of these interacting factors that can potentially be, be leading them towards that route. And that's why I think a, an empathetic approach to coaching can be so effective because it allows you to not just look at this person as like, well, they're this weight, this height, therefore they need that many calories and this is how they should apply it. You can also look at it in terms of the difficulties that they may have. And although you're not a psychotherapist and you're never going to be able to help them deal with these problems wholesale, you can still talk to them like a person and you can appreciate where they're coming from and, and it will allow you to maybe understand it a little bit more, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, certainly. And I guess we're, something that I've become more and more aware of is that our job as coaches is really behavior change and finding why people are overeating when they're overeating you know and it, at this sort of fundamental level it is as simple as looking at someone's height weight body composition and being like this is roughly your energy needs if we want to put you at a deficit and lose some weight this is what you need that's the complete fundamentals so yeah once you've got that right I mean that's like the first line of the thesis Mm -hmm. then you have to actually work with them how are we going to create this deficit how are you going to create a lifestyle that you can stick to where are your problems when are you most likely to binge if that is a problem for you um how do we overcome that you know you're so, just the whole package is so much more than just energy balance and yeah i think i put up like a meme about that yesterday actually and it was just so i think once a lot of the time when even us as coaches realize that or like quite young PTs often or new PTs like oh energy balance is the only thing that matters like just get someone in negative energy balance they'll lose weight like yeah you're right of course but it's nowhere near that simple and it never will be um yeah so it's the sort of like yeah if you don't have that foundation then none of the rest really matters because you won't get any results but the fact that even to build that foundation like how are you going to do that how are you going to create that energy about that energy deficit is it better for someone to track calories or is it better for someone to reduce a food group are you going to look at meal timings like yeah you're right none of these factors matter in themselves but it's that behavioral change that is going to influence their long-term success at this yeah definitely um so just to kind of to round off the conversation i think it would be useful to just say we get quite a lot of like new personal trainers listening to this podcast um or potentially people who aren't personal trainers yet but they're looking to transition into that kind of career um so what advice would you kind of give to them pertaining to this topic when they first come into it because obviously digging into the genetic research and, and digging into all of that is great but a lot of people don't have the time or the ability to do that straight away at least um so oh, where, would you, where people, would you start so i was gonna say a lot of people and a lot of personal trainers aren't like massive geeks like we are so i wouldn't expect you to do that but a basic understanding is all you need um there's a huge amount of research out there and to dig for it all would be you know we don't expect you to be experts in everything um and your clients don't either but having like a base knowledge of understanding and empathy towards your client um but is extremely important so understanding that yes genetics does play a huge role it and then explaining to your client that that's not because you can't lose weight it's just that you might find it harder and you might not you might need me to support you more we might need to spend a bit longer doing this um and i'm here to help you through this and not just you know and i guess trying to get them away from the misconception that because they've been dealt a hard card in the terms of genetics that they can't lose weight but it's, it's nothing to do with that it's just that you might be hungrier and we might have to look at your activity levels a little bit more closely to make sure you're not compensating for the energy deficit we're trying to create and then explaining to them that and uh being yeah being empathetic to that that yeah it, it is going to be hard and but i'm going to help you through it and there's loads of ways we can do this and yeah it's not the end of the world that maybe you've struggled with weight loss in the past and maybe some of that is genetic yeah i think one thing that that comes out of it as well is kind of what you mentioned there where you might need to take a little bit longer to do it because um 
I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but if not, here we go anyway. Um, I'm quite a fan of relatively quick fat loss, um, especially with overweight clients, because uh, there's, there's quite a few re- papers that indicate that rapid fat loss in the, in the initial stages of a fat loss approach, um, that results in better long-term weight loss and better long-term weight loss maintenance. Um, yeah, I, I mean, sorry to jump in, but I hugely agree with you there, especially when they've got a lot to lose. And some of the research is amazing, like this would be an extreme, but if you've heard of the Newcastle diet where they take type two diabetics and they put them on very low, so it's like 800 calorie a day diets, which obviously is an extreme and you would never do that long term, but they can reverse type two diabetes in terms of fasting blood glucose levels in just seven days. And the metabolic improvements in your health that you're gonna get from losing weight rapidly at the start and then also the motivational aspect of, for that um, is huge. And because you're, you've got so much energy, you know, people are worried that you're starving people. You have so much energy stored in fat that that's not an issue. If you're overweight and you've got excess fat, you know, starving is not going to be an issue as long as you're getting in those, you know, vital nutrients that you need. And even, I don't know if you've seen the case study of the man who fasted for like over a year, yeah, he just had like, he had like multivitamins at one point, but even that, he didn't seem to have a lot of them. It seemed like he was just on water because... Yeah, I mean, he was medically, so he, he actually, weirdly, I only discovered this a while ago, but he did it in Dundee, which is where I'm from. <laughs> um, so he did go into the hospital and like he got all his blood checked and like, I mean, we're obviously not advocating doing this, but it's just an interesting point to prove that, you know, he, he lived off his body fat levels, off his body fat for over a year. Yeah, I'm sure like six months after he put like four kilos back on or something, like yeah, a mean, meaningless amount. Yeah, which which is it's just incredible. But so yeah, I'm a big fan of that, and of course I've heard of the Newcastle study. It's it's the best thing the Northeast's done. Yeah, of- <laughs> <laughs> it's our one contribution to. Although, you know, when people say I'm like, oh, the Newcastle diet, they're like, what? Isn't that like I don't know? I think they expect like kebab or cheesy chips and gravy. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm like, no, it's some fast shakes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But I just, I think that that's brilliant. But we do need to still put that in the context that some people are going to really struggle with that. Um, because while it will work mechanistically, you need to get someone who's actually able to do it. And if this is a type of person whose hunger is going to increase to the point that it's unbearable, um, we should be open to that not necessarily working and just thinking we will use the the old school slow and steady approach because it seems the only way that you're going to actually be able to withstand this. Yeah, and I think people get a bit, I don't know if someone's confused, but they think, oh, I have to use this one approach for this one person for the whole time. That, yeah. you know, you can take a quick initial fat loss approach and then say, right, we're going to increase your calories because we're going to now get you on a sustainable fat loss journey. You know, you've lost X amount and then, yeah, you're right. You have to sort of coach them into knowing that you're not going to lose, you know, two to three kilograms every week for a long time. Like these are just initial drops um, and that will plateau, but we're now looking at a longer term approach and they've possibly already, well, hopefully already bought into you and your approach because you've got the results already. They're motivated you know, maybe they've lost enough weight that they feel better exercising, that they enjoy going for walks now. And so there's so many benefits to sort of a quick approach initially, as long as you can coach them into a longer term lifestyle approach after. Yeah. What you said there is good as well, that in that what people do for the duration of a diet doesn't have to be the same all of the time. Um, and th- there's quite a lot of evidence that it potentially shouldn't. I don't know, have you, have you seen the, the Matador study? No, tell me about it. Um, I can't remember what Matador stands for, but it does stand for something. Uh, oh, and yeah, the, I think I have seen that, but tell me, tell me. Yeah, um, it's basically, a, it was a big sort of meta, I think it was a meta-analysis. It might have been, it might have been some other kind of collection of studies, but it was a study of studies anyway. Um, and they looked at intermittent calorie restriction. So it was people who were dieting for a given period of time, and then not dieting for a given period of time, repeated for the duration of a diet. So 
basically sometimes they were in a calorie deficit and sometimes they weren't. And what they discovered was that it, it, it ended up with equivalent amounts of weight loss, but with reduced amounts of uh, lean body mass loss. And as well, it started to, I think one of the biggest finds was in a lot of the studies, not all of them, but in a lot of them, um, it ended up with the people having better weight loss maintenance after the diet. So, yeah, I did see that. It was really interesting. Was it like, wasn't that one two weeks on, two weeks off type of? So after the Matador trial, they, they did the study that I think you're referring to there. Oh, okay. um, so what that one was, it was a 16-week diet, but some people did it in 16 weeks. Some people did it across, I think it was 32 weeks. Yeah, that was it. It was two weeks on, two weeks off. And at the end, the people who'd done the on-off had a smaller amount of adaptive thermogenesis. So their, their metabolic rate had reduced to a lesser degree. And it, that, that's an approach that I use with clients now. Um, so I usually that. have clients, because I, I don't have overweight clients at the minute. Um, I, don't, I only really keep a couple of clients on, to be honest, because I work, I work full time for BTN and I'm a big proponent of people not stretching themselves too thin to the point that they're service standards drop a bit quality over quantity yes exactly um quite like the way you said that that was good um but yeah i, I usually have clients diet for a week and then maintain for a week and diet for a week and maintain for a week and what they report is that they don't feel like they're dieting because that one week they know that on monday they get more food so they're not that bothered and although it does take a little bit longer it means that we can also maintain better sporting performance. We can maintain better performance in the gym because they're never depleted, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it gets less boring as well. And yeah, like you say, you've got that to look forward to. I find that that works more so with overweight clients for me with like sort of intermittent fasting, if they enjoy doing that, you know, you've got two days a week. Nobody's, they know that they're going to be able to eat a hell of a lot more the next day if they want, if, mm. but you know, today we're keeping you busy and we're having a lower calorie day. It, yeah. I think that sort of short term approach is, can be a good way to make a deficit without you feeling like you're on a diet. And I always think that that's a huge part of it. So your perception of restriction or your perception of being on a diet, quote unquote, um, is a huge factor in the success of your diet. Yeah. So would that be sort of like a, a 5-2 style approach that you would use or... Have I got the wrong end of the stick there? Yeah, yeah. So I've used approaches like that before. And, I, you know, actually, most people find it fairly easy. I guess there's, on the one side, there's the people that are like, what, like only eating 500 calories a day or 600 calories a day? That's absolutely obscene. I could never do that, blah, blah, blah. And then on the other side, they're like, oh, I only have to diet for two days a week. Or I only have to sort of feel like I'm restricting myself for two days a week. And then I eat, quote, unquote, again, like normally. Mm -hmm. you know you're going to be in a deficit by the end of the week if you don't overeat on the other days it's kind of again like it works for certain individuals because they have that they perceive that diet as less restrictive but for some individuals they perceive that diet as extremely restrictive yeah and on the flip side like calorie counting is the same some people perceive that as not restrictive at all they're like i can eat whatever i want as long as i stick to my calorie goal over the week other people are like oh, I, you know, I don't want to count. It just feels like I'm restricting myself and everything. Like I'd much rather just choose foods that are likely going to put me in a deficit. So cut out quite a lot of carbohydrates maybe, or, you know, a way that you don't need to track, which maybe 5-2 would work for them, that they probably will end up in a deficit without necessarily having to track their calories. Yeah, that's why I think it's so important to involve, involve your clients with the decisions that you make um, and just, just run your coaching in general as like a client-centered approach because if you don't ask the client, you'll end up prescribing them something like, oh, okay, so I want you to count calories and I want you to do this. And if the client doesn't enjoy doing that, it'll probably take you two months to find that out, by which point they haven't made progress, they've lost faith in what you're doing and they'll, they'll probably just sack off coaching altogether. If, if you involve your client and just say, well, we could do this approach or we could do this approach. These are the pros and cons. What do you think? Um, it just enables them to be involved with that decisional process. And then when someone makes their own decision and when someone decides to do something for themselves, they're always going to stick to it more. Yeah, it's that autonomy, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, the, the reason I asked about the 5-2 thing is actually, to be fair, um, I'm going to start dieting soon because I, I have gotten fat. Um, Body power's coming up. <laughs> yeah, man, I've got nine days. <laughs> um, oh, God, I better get started on presentations, eh? Oh. I did mine yesterday, so it's fine. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I'm thinking of dieting myself, and I've been actually thinking about doing something similar to the 5-2 diet. Um just because there are two days per week that I don't train. And mm. I'm thinking I could diet for them like in a pretty extreme manner, because to be fair, my day job is this, I sit down, um, I don't really do anything. So it wouldn't be too difficult for me, I don't think. And yeah, I just thought it would be an interesting approach to try because I'm definitely that person you mentioned who hates counting calories. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, so am I with them. I'll always get people like, oh, what are your calories? What are your macro splits? And I'm like, yeah, I do know roughly what my calories are, but and I know that I get in enough protein and blah blah blah. Fats and carbs change, but I don't like counting calories. I don't like doing that. You know, it. I'd much rather if I was trying to lose weight fast or do something like that, where I know that I'm probably in a deficit, but I've just done it without having to anally track everything. Yeah. Um... Have you always done it that way or did you, have you tracked calories for... A- Honestly, but like, yeah. Really? I, but mainly because when I, so when I was in my fitness modeling phase, um, I don't know, I just ate roughly the same things most days. Um, weekends would be a little bit different, but I guess I was, you know, I was working as a full-time PT. I was very active. It wasn't that hard to create a deficit because I was training lots and yeah and like my breakfast lunch my breakfast and lunch would be the same every day dinner might be a bit different but i'd know that if at you know it's the end of the week or whatever i hadn't lost weight i'd just reduce a bit or i'd change you know i just did it on changing foods and just watching my progress and if i decided that i needed to eat a bit less then i'd swap out a food and swap it something less calorie dense yeah yeah, I actually eat that. I eat like that now. Um, I have the same breakfast and lunch every day, six days a week, I think. And it, it, it's nothing other than laziness. Um, yeah, and do you know what? As much as people that always promote variety, and yet yeah, great if you can get variety in your diet, but most of us will habitually end up eating the same breakfast and lunch-ish every day. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think... It, it is good to vary it around. Like I try to vary my vegetables around and stuff just for some sort of semblance of nutrient balance. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, varying your veg, but I mean, it's still a chicken salad, isn't it? Even if yeah. you put in like different ingredients and it's still going to be roughly X amount of calories and yeah. And then you get people that do that, but yet yeah, track it every single day. And I'm like, you don't need to track it because it's the same. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's insane yeah. god but yeah i think it's an interesting thing because lyle mcdonald talks about it, doesn't he where he says that people who eat intuitively don't i think there's a there's a big drive that eating intuitively is is the best thing and everyone should be able to eat intuitively and i think to some extent that is true but in order to eat intuitively i think you need that baseline knowledge first or you need to eat the same food every day more or less yeah. <laughs> Um, just to make it interesting Um, I don't know if eating intuitively is the same as not tracking no you know I mean most people are like oh if I'm not tracking then I'm just eating intuitively and like you said like we both work in nutrition to some extent and I can eyeball a plate of food and know roughly how many calories that is I don't particularly count it up in my head but I'll know that I've had x amount and I need roughly x amount it's not specific and it's not exact and some days it'll be more and some days it'll be less but yeah if you've got that base knowledge of how many calories are in certain foods and roughly what you need for your goals then eating intuitively whatever that might the actual definition of that is yeah it sort of comes with that yeah that's why I just think it's important to sort of state that because we do talk a lot on this podcast, and we've mentioned it a few times here, that some clients, for example, might count calories, some clients might track, and some might not. But I, I've 
like your opinion on this, but I do think it's important for people to have some understanding of calories, whether they're tracking them or not. I think that that baseline knowledge is a really important part of maintaining a healthy weight now for most people. I think way back in the day when food was really basic and you couldn't get enough of it in the first place and everything that you ate was really filling. Um, no, you didn't need to count calories, but I think the pushback against counting calories is a bit misplaced because yeah. it's, a bit, it's, it's, it's a bit too far. Like, I don't think everyone should count calories, but I think they should know about them at least. Yeah, I would agree. I think, well, actually, I would say everyone should count calories for a week, maybe, or even a couple of days of just anally tracking calories. Yes, it's boring. Yes, it's, you know, I want you to weigh out your food and see exactly what portion size actually looks like. But even now, like if I make myself do that, I'm still shocked at, oh God, like that's a portion size of like cereal. Like it's absolutely nothing. It's so small. And yeah, even so many people on Facebook now are doing these comparisons. You can eat this amount of this and, or this is what 200 calories of broccoli looks like. This is what 200 calories of oil looks like. What's going to fill you up more? Like some of them are ridiculous, but some of them prove a really good point. Mm -hmm. Um, and the knowledge of that, so it's definitely worth, even if it's just for an educational tool, getting clients for the first three days maybe to track everything, just yeah. so they can see where those calories are adding up. And they might be like, oh, I didn't realize that having this coffee was going to add, you know, almost a meal to my calorie count, or I could have had this instead, or blah, blah, blah. It just gets them to be more aware. Yeah. It doesn't mean they need to do it long term. <laughs> But you're completely right. The awareness of that, especially with uh, going back to our sort of food environment now, where what seemingly is a little snack can add up to a huge amount of calories. Yeah, definitely. I think it is the snacks as well that people I don't think, well, I mean, I can't for the life of me remember the paper, but I, I mentioned this in the food environment notes on the academy. Um, the, the main things that are mistracked or people, the things that people miss off of their food diaries, um, snacks, drinks, and condiments. And they're the things that people don't even think about until they start to look at things like calories because well, it's just a squirt of mayonnaise, but that squirt of mayonnaise, if it's the full fat one, that's 100 calories that you've just added to your meal. Um, and it's not inconsequential like that. It does matter. Yeah, especially when people are trying to tell you it, what they've eaten or what do you have for dinner oh I just had chicken and veg with some potatoes all right okay but like how what did you cook the chicken in like those are the things that matter so normally what people are eating is pretty good but actually they saw that you know all not olive oil uh coconut oil was great so they've lathered their chicken in that and that's doubled the calories and then they put it on their veg because it tastes nicer but it's quote unquote good for you but they're not you know they haven't understood how many calories are in that and how that can add up as well and that even if it is good for you even if it's not these calories still matter yeah there was a good paper on that a while ago i think it was brian wansink so it might be a questionable paper but i think it was him anyway um it was shortly after subway did their big drive about promoting how healthy subways are um and they asked participants to estimate the calories in a Subway foot long something and a Big Mac and they overestimated the Big Mac by like 50% and underestimated the Subway by like 50% um, just because one of them was perceived as healthy and the other one wasn't. Yeah. Um, they then got them to go into either Subway or McDonald's and they had a voucher and the voucher was good for one of the sandwiches and then they could pick a side, a drink um, and I think like a cookie because that was the only thing that was common between Subway and McDonald's. Um, and the people who had the Subway picked higher calorie drinks and higher calorie sides and a higher calorie dessert than the people with the Big Mac. So it ended up where the people with the Subway were eating like a thousand more calories just because of that health halo, just because they thought, well, this is healthy, therefore I can have more of it. And therefore also I can have higher calorie sides because why not? I've had the healthy sandwich. Yeah. That you see that so much with activity as well. Like, oh, I went to a spin class this morning so I can have an extra muffin with my with my cup of tea or whatever. And but it, saying that, that 
I'm quite surprised now, that, like pleasantly surprised that places like Burger King, McDonald's, KFC, like they all offer like a pretty decent salad. Mm. Um, and like with a decent amount of protein as well, like a chicken salad from any of those places is decent. Like, so yeah, it's good that there, there are more options now. And even though they're sort of perceived as, yeah, like some of the options at McDonald's are pretty good. You get like a chicken wrap and people, oh, that's a McDonald's, like that must be unhealthy. But actually, it's a decent option when you're on the go. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the amount of reasonable food available now cheaply and easily is it's impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, and going back to the food environment, it only, it only sort of represents that the fact that I think public consciousness towards health is starting to increase demand for that. Um, and if the demand's there, the market's going to keep offering it and it can only be a good thing that that's actually playing out. So Yeah, and all the, the calorie information now is there as well, which is a huge step forward, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I'll leave you to get back to your day now. I think we'll wrap that up. That's been an awesome episode. I've really enjoyed that. I hope um, I hope everybody listening at home's taken some like really useful take homes from that because yeah, I think we covered a lot of really useful ground there, and I think I think it's been a good episode. So before we go, before we go, can we just say is there anywhere on social media where people can find you? How do we find out more about your work? Where where are you located online? You can find me on Facebook at ESG Fitness or Emma Story Gordon Fitness. Um, also on Instagram at ESG Fitness, Twitter at ESG Fitness. I have a website which I never use, which is www.esgfitness.co.uk. Um, but yeah, probably Facebook is the best place to find me and then from there. So yeah anyone has any questions do feel free to contact me always happy to discuss stuff so yeah you brought out some really good content as well as i said at the start so i think if anybody's not following you then that is their mistake oh thank you very much (laughs) so but thank you very much for your time um for everyone listening there is still if you're interested in learning more about these kinds of things there is still a little bit of time to sign up for the btn practical academy we'll be launching on the 22nd of may so if you're interested in finding out not just about the nuts and bolts of food but also the way that we can influence people's lifestyle and behavior choices and things and the way we can just communicate a little bit better and a little bit more empathetically so that we can help people to action change in their own lives on their own terms um, then please do check that out it's the best offering we've ever had and i think it'll be a great year so other than that thank you very much emma i've really appreciated your time awesome i will see you at body power i will see you at body power and anyone else who's listening if you see me at body power come say hello um, fist bump me so i know who you are um, i'm only telling people on the podcast to do that so it means that I can it. <laughs> yeah and thank you very much for listening and we'll speak to you next time goodbye Whoa, just before you go, a couple of things. Firstly, if you need my help at any point in time, reach out to my Facebook fan page, ask a question, and I'll get back to you. The reason I like my Facebook fan page is because I can send like voice memos back, and it's really time efficient for me to be able to help as many people as possible. If you want to find out just anything I'm up to, keep abreast of social media, make sure you're on my email newsletter, and all of that info is at bencoomer.com. If you want nutrition education in the future, then have a look at the BTN Academy. That's our online nutrition courses. If you want to be coached by me, then join my 90-day body and mind transformation program, Fat Loss for Life. And if you're looking for clarity, honesty, simplicity, and research-proven supplements that taste awesome, then go to awesomesupplements.co.uk. That's my links. That's where to find me. That's where to find the cool stuff. I'm out. Have an awesome day. Hey everyone, Bankroom Radio. It is great to have you back.